2 Timothy, uh, we've been going through this section uh, in this Word of God, uh, chapter 1, because I really feel that God is breaking this down in a, in a very systematic way for me, and I hope I can present it to you that way. We're going to be reading, um, I'll be reading from verse 6 and then down to verse 13. It says, For this reason I remind you to fan the flames of the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear or, t or timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. Amen? Don't be ashamed. It's Paul Amen. telling Timothy. Uh, or uh, about our Lord, or shame of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, which I'll be teaching on next week, the suffering. Oh boy, it's church going to be full that day, huh? <laughs> We're talking about suffering for God, um, for the gospel, by the power of God, who has saved us and, and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death. Can you say destroy death? Destroy death. Hallelujah. Which, which that means, for you that don't know, and most of you probably know, when you take your last breath on this earth, you're going to be present in eternity with God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So he destroyed the fear of death. That's why we have a hope of our salvation. We say we have salvation. We accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. But the hope of our salvation, the completeness of our salvation, is we're standing in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And there'll be a new heaven and new earth, and things will be a little bit different than they are today. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he has brought uh, life and immorality, immorality to light through the gospel. Life and immorality was given to us through the gospel. And of this gospel, I appointed a, I been appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. This is why I'm suffering as I am. The second part of what we're going to be talking about today. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I believe. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. And that last part of what we'll be talking about today. I have entrusted to him until that day. Father, I pray and I, I'm in awe of your presence here today. God, I look and see things in the natural, but God, I know in the supernatural, if we just open our eyes and see about uh, what's above us, the, the supernatural, the angels, and the, the, those that are ready to, to, to be at our beckoning call. Lord, I just thank you for that today, that we don't see just in our natural. But we commit to, uh, to you this day, God, that you'll keep us until the very end. Amen. Because we walk in your power and your grace. Father, I pray that you hide me behind the very cross of Christ this morning. And to the words that are about to be spoken, God, will bring life to those that are here. Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. I've been teaching uh, a couple weeks ago. We taught on salvation. We talked about the hope of our salvation. And, and then Tina talked about, last week, she talked about sanctification. So we got a bunch of S's going on here for the next few weeks. And then we have, today we're talking about the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. God spoke into existence light. The heavens and earth were formed. Amen. God said the sovereignty of God. He's in control of everything. He says the, the, the earth is the footstool of God. He's in control. It shows the authority of Jesus over everything that is happening. Every person, every situation, everything is in the hands of God. Amen? I believe, it, I believe that he has given us that sovereignty or revealed that sovereignty to us, to us so we have hope. Yes. Amen? Amen. How many ever heard that God is in control? Amen? Yes. Have you ever heard that statement, God is in control? I wrote it on, the, on, my, on my thing right here on uh, this board. It says, God is in control. Yes. yes. God is in control. Now listen, how many scholars I have out there today? A lot of scholars, right? You guys understand the Word of God, right? 
Show me in the Bible where it says God is in control. Look in your Bible. Look in your look in your uh, your dictionary there. Look on your iPhone. Find me a scripture that says God is in control. You won't find one by the way, but go ahead and look anyway. But we know He is, right? Yes. We know He is because of a relationship. We know He is because He provided salvation for us. Amen. We know He is. How many know uh, sometimes when our life is out of control, we're spinning out of control, and life situation brings us stop, it's like we have to be reminded that God's in control. I always, I always marvel at other Christians as they try to comfort people when their life's out of control. You ever get this? Maybe a young 18-year-old, 20-year-old guy. You're, you've been old, you're, you're a little bit older. You've got some situations. A young Christian guy will come up to you and goes, Don't worry. God is in control. Right? You just want to smack them, right? <laughs> Christians always get to say, they just say, that sometimes they say just the wrong things at the wrong time, and you just want to go, you, don't, you already know that, you just need some comfort, right? But what if somebody comes up to you, maybe a, an older lady, maybe somebody in their late 70s, 80s, they've been through the depression, they've been through life's trials, their husband left them when they're young, they had to raise their children, amen, and she had two or three jobs, and she, she, she put her kids through school, and, and, and she raised them by herself, and, and life, she's at the end of her life, and then she comes up to you, and she puts her hand on you, her, her, her hand that shows age and, and all the things that she's been through, and then she lays her hands on you, and she says, listen, honey, God is in control. Does that bring you more comfort? Doesn't it? Because on the other side of trials, on the other side of tribulation, on the other side of life situation, there's peace because you know God has brought you through so much. And I want to hope today that when, as we go through the sermon today, you'll realize that God is in control. And we have situations that we need Him to encourage us in, and He wants to help His children. But there's also things that God doesn't control. There's life situations and life decisions that you make that God really doesn't influence you at. They're, they're your decisions. Amen. There's, there's choices that you make. We call that grace, I guess. God allows you. Now think about it. You can't be driving down the road, all right, and take, you're driving your car down the road on the Beltline in Madison, right? And you say, God, you're in control. And you let go of the steering wheel. You're in control, God. What's going to happen? You're going to get in an accident, right? Meet God. You're going to get in an accident. So that's not probably a good choice by letting go of the steering wheel and saying, God is in control. But God is in control, right? We, we say it this way most times. God, you are in control. You are God. You are the one that's in charge of everything. A lot of us Christians, we just kind of say sometimes, well, God's in control. Kind of a flippant attitude. We don't really understand the power of what we just said. God, you are in control. But we don't let him be in control. Now, let's go back to verse 12 real quick here. Let's, I want to read this last part to you. It says, I know whom I believe in. I know whom I believe. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. See, we as individuals, let me just put a circle here. Pretty good. This is our world. And we want to be in control. That's what I said. We, we want to be in control. You want to be in control of your situation. We want to make decisions. But we don't want to allow God to do that. And what happens we always get in a situation like we're in control, we make things happen, and we can control some things, right? We can make good decisions. So I think in God, in the sovereignty of God, He allows us to make decisions for our life. Right? How about the house you live in? Or the place you're renting? Or the type of car you're driving? Or how you're going to raise your kids? Or the clothes you wear? Is God always going to give you those answers? But can we ask God to help us with those answers? I'm sure, he, I'm sure he will help us. I mean, I don't know if he'll worry about if I picked out the right clothes in my closet. That's why he gave me a wife. 
<laughs> or some kids, because my kids will tell me, Dad, they're pretty good at that. Go back and change. I need those kind of clothes that have the, like, the little animal on them so you can match the shirt and the pants that came out a few years ago. That'd be really good for me. But anyway, but the, God, the, God's not really concerned about my dress, is he? He's not really concerned about where I live or, or what I do or how I do it, really. He really gets, what is God concerned about? He's concerned about what's here. You can be and do anything you want in this world, but is your heart right with God? Amen? Paul's seen this. Paul, now think about it. When things are in, when things are going well in your life, we kind of want to just bless God, right? When, when things are going well, we just like, hey, praise the Lord, we're going on this right thing. God is in control. Everything's cool. Uh, everything's right. Look at Paul's ministry. And that's what we say. Remember, when we talk about Paul here in, in 2 Timothy, he wrote this letter when he was in prison. He was encouraging young Timothy, listen, no matter, don't be embarrassed about Jesus. Don't even be embarrassed that I'm in, in prison. I want you to know, God is in control of your life. If you would do these things, and he gives him a list of things to do. He's encouraging him, and I want to encourage you today. But look at Paul's ministry. God was in control. Think about in Acts chapter 13 and 14. I mean, whatever Paul did, God blessed. After he was on the road to Damascus, after he you know, went into the desert for a while, after he spent some time with God, with Jesus out in the desert, he came back and all of a sudden he began to preach the gospel. He began to share about Jesus. He began to share the, the person he was persecuting was the real Jesus. And he, and he began to share so much that he started churches all over Asia, right? First missionary journey. And everything his hands did was successful. Went to the synagogue, shared about Jesus. All those people who gave their life to Christ, the synagogue now had a Christian, organ, a Christian group. Went to another town, look at Ephesus. Look at all these different places he went to. It was success. Matter of fact, he was so powerful in the presence of God that even his handkerchief, his snot ray, was used to, as a prayer cloth. Just touch this piece of cloth, Paul, and I'll give it to the sick person, and guess what? God healed them. Hallelujah. Come on, get excited. I want to do that again, right? I want to see that happen again. But Paul, had, and during that time, he could, Paul would say, God is in control, just like we do. But, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not like that. We're like that. We, since we were teenagers, or maybe around the age of, well, even a little more, I guess, you know, we have the gimme thing when kids are about four or five years old, they want everything, right? But around teenage, you know, 11, 12 years old is kind of like, and I have some teenagers here, so they can verify this. But they say things like this. When I grow up, I'm not going to have to do, right? They don't want to be in control. None of us want to be in control. It's part of our sin nature. We get it, right? It's part of our life. It's like, I want to be in control of my life the way I want to do things. Parents can say amen, or teenagers say hallelujah. But isn't it true? We all been through that. Can't wait till I get out of the house so I can do my own thing. And then when they get out there, like I did anyway, now I don't know about you guys, but man, my life was really messed up in those years between 16 and 19, right? I was, thought I knew everything, thought I could do anything I wanted, and found out reality is not the same as what I think in my heart and mind, right? Because of our sin nature. So we want to be in control. It's part of our nature. We always want to be in control. But then tragedy happens, right? Then, you know, we have, uh, you know, what about, what if we, uh, what if cancer hits us? What if, um, I'm not very good uh, with the crayon. Divorce happens to your family, huh? What happens when you gotta go through that? I'm a believer, I love Jesus, but my spouse is like going another direction. What happens when that happens? Or any type of sickness? Also, it's not in our control. You're relying on doctors, you're relying on other people, you're relying on our lawyers, you're relying on your friends. What do I do? It's dark. It's, there's always sometimes things that are not within our control. 
See, there's, there's human responsibility to the sovereignty of God. You have a responsibility. See, it, when we go through these type of things, how do we move on? Where's our faith? I love singing that song. Till the very end. It kind of goes with the sermon today. What happens when problems happen? Am I going to really rely on God? Or this is like I do sometimes. Or do we default back to doing things in our natural? Because we can control them. And I feel comforted in that part process in, in trials and tribulations where I'm controlling it. Well, if I'm short on money, I'll just get a credit card. I can run that up to a couple thousand dollars. That'll be fine for a while. Right? We stop giving to the church. We stop giving to the people, people that we give to. We start taking things for ourselves. We don't have faith enough to trust God will help us through a situation. Come on, am I talking to anybody here today? Yeah. Or, you know, or when sickness comes. We go out, first thing we do is get on the internet and find out all about the sickness. Because there's information out there about everything and every problem and every situation you need. And, I mean, you can go through that thing, and I tell you what, you read it, and you're more confused than you were before you started. Right? Hope begins to leave in the spiritual realm. Let me tell you what happened in the spiritual realm. Your hope begins to leave because you're starting to rely on man. Who wrote those articles anyway? Right? And I don't know. I mean, just... Everything's true on the internet, I guess. <laughs> but you can begin to research, and I do this for myself, so I know I'm, I'm just as guilty as the next person. What do I have to do about this situation in my life? This thing about the, I'm, uh, the doctor's giving uh, giving me some new medicine. So you know they give you uh, when you go to the pharmacy and you get the medicine, right? All of a sudden you get this list of things that is bad about the medicine. <laughs> You're like, what am I taking this for? I mean, I don't want all those things that happen to me. So you research it, and then confusion comes, and then fear comes in, and all of a sudden we're not where we're supposed to be. Faith begins to leave. When fear comes in, faith begins to leave, and my hope in God begins to diminish because now I'm relying on my information from the Internet or from other people. But to be in control in the supernatural, you have to rely on God through every trial and tribulation. Amen. Right? Yes. You have to trust God through your situation, because then when you do, then hope begins to be restored in you. Maybe I'm telling you this sermon because we have to say God's control. What happens when in that time, what happens, we say, like Paul did, because you know when Paul is starting churches and people are being healed by his handkerchiefs, I mean, it's an amazing time. God is in control, but at, when problems come in our life, we go like this. We go, is God in control? Right? We can begin to have confusion and, and fear and doubt comes over us. Is God really in control? He is, obviously. We can say yes now, but when we're going through a problem situation, it kind of it makes it a little bit difficult, doesn't it? Is God in control? Or are we saying, God, are you in control? I'm not really sure right now because I made a lot of decisions that caused me not to have hope and I begin to have fear in my life. But he is. We went through a lot of stuff this past year. Amen? I, I love how God brings you through things, not leave you in things. Amen? I mean, why do we go through things? The Word of God tells us this is for the testing of our faith. Is that okay? And God tests your faith so He can make you stronger in the faith. So you can be what he wants you to be now or when the next trial or tribulation comes. And you, your people around you will say, well, you have cancer. Yes. Are you going to get depressed immediately and seek off? You know what I'm saying? Or are you going to say, okay, God. Right? And I believe God heals. We've seen God heal cancer here. So we just believe that God can heal cancer. Right? That's an easy one. We've seen that happen a couple times here. Fine. In the name of Jesus, God heal that. But what happens if he doesn't? Are we going to get all, oh my God, God didn't do that? No. Are we allow fear to come back into our lives? Are we going to allow us to turn back to our natural understanding of things? Or are we going to go back to the word of God? And I want to encourage you today. This word, right? This is where hope is increased. Amen? This is where you strengthen your faith in God. 
is we're in the Word. But what happens every time we, we get these situations in our life, what really happens is we begin to go back to our default. We put this aside for a little. We don't want to do it. Like, listen, that didn't work, so why don't you just do this instead? He puts doubt and fear in your life. Amen? Come on, am I telling the truth or not? He, tell, he puts fear in you because he takes away the hope that's in the Word of God and you rely on maybe some old sermon that was spoken, maybe some old knowledge that you had in the past. But listen, just like the children of Israel had to go every morning and collect the manna. You remember the story? And they were in the desert and they had to go every morning and collect manna. And they ate the manna every day. This is word is the, is the manna, the bread of life. We'll be teaching a little commercial break. We'll be teaching uh, again this January on the tabernacle prayer. And remember, when you go through the holy place, and on the right side is the loaves of bread that represents the 12 tribes of Israel, right? But it also represents the Word of God. And we as a church, not only do we have to pray, we know that brings us the power of God, but we have to strengthen ourselves in the Word of God. And when we come together, then we see this power that happens. Amen? Something happens when everybody is in unity. The, um, and I'm going to digress just a little bit. I'll be back. But we are gathering together, the board and myself, we're gathering together this uh, Wednesday night with Pastor Jorge and his board. And we're going to try to come together as one church. And as I've been praying about it this week, you know, it's so difficult to try to bring people together, even as Christians. But as I told you uh, uh, last October, not this past, but a year ago, that the Lord gave me John 17, that we be one as Christ be one. Who's we? All the believers, right? Now, I don't mean we have to have one big church, and, and you know, we understand that every, there's different ministries, and I get all that. But for... I will do, and we will do, what's in our influence to do. Amen? And we'll bring the different churches together, and we'll bring different nationalities together, and different people groups together, and worship God. I love when we worship God with the Korean church uh, a month ago or so. I love that. Three different churches, probably 10, 20 different nations, I don't know how many different nations were represented. We're worshiping God. It's a very simple Christian song. I was in I was in heaven. I was so excited. I, I was glad Pastor uh, was preaching with me because I would just go off because I was just so excited. Because in unity there's power. Amen. In unity the Amen. enemy cannot. It's so hard to bring. Would you pray for us? Pray for the board. Pray for us as we come together and figure out what we need to do to be more than just. Uh, what we're doing now. Okay? And I think 2014, God's going to do that. Amen? So pray for that. Because God not is in control as a question mark. In our lives, we believe God is in control. Amen? As, as Richard was sharing a little bit about the finances of the church. You know, God gave him that $15,000. That was a blessing. He asked, God did it. Hallelujah. We give him all the glory for that. Amen? It wasn't... But, when we say God is in control, it's not what a question is, it's what reality, we know He is. And He answers your prayer and my prayer. Amen? We have to allow Him to be in control in every aspect of our life. Every aspect of our life. You say amen? Every aspect of our lives, we have to allow God to be in control. There's no part of being a Christian that God is only part of, okay, I'm a Christian today because I'm on Sunday morning and I'm here together with other believers. What happens on Monday? Is God control on Monday? It's easy to say God's in control on Sunday when we're all together. Hey, God's in control. Woo Amen. And as soon as we leave those doors and something happens, we lose it. Come on. Is it just me? It happens. Like, God has control. But see, on our life, as ours, as it's just, just a few people out here today, if you can say, hey, God's in control on Monday. And the enemy's going to come in like a flood to try to knock you off your what you believe, right? That's what his job is. So we already know that. We recognize that. The enemy's not hiding. Come on, saints. The enemy's not hiding around the corner trying to trip you up. He's really blatant. As soon as pastor's done preaching, that uh, unbelief comes in. 
As soon as you hear the word of God, the enemy's going to try and put doubt in your mind. It's immediately. He does it. It's the way he works. So we have to recognize that. Should I, uh, should I pray with my spouse or not pray for my spouse? Amen? Should we pray together or not pray? Well, I don't feel like praying tonight. You know what? Pray anyway. Right? Or when somebody says to you, man, my knee really hurts really bad. And to me, your first thought is, I want to pray for that person. And then you don't. How many have done that? Come on. Be honest. Thank you for you two people who are honest. It happens. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want you to know that God is true. And he's going to take that away. But what would happen if you would pray for that person? I mean, hopefully, what would happen is they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior because of the love that you showed them. Right? So let me challenge you with something. It's not in my notes. <laughs> I'll get back to them in a minute. Let me challenge you. On December 22nd is our international Christmas service. Now, I'm not all into the trees. We'll probably put the tree up this week, uh, decorate the church. It looks pretty for Christmas. That's not for me. That's for all the young believers that come here on Christmas Day. Right? Those were the, people, the visitors that we have that on this day they think, well, maybe I should go to church because the Holy Spirit's been dealing with them and they come to church. It's not for us. It's for those that are outside this church. Amen? And that's why we're going to decorate the church this year the way we're going to do it. Amen? Because it's not for us. So we're going to challenge. We're going to make, I haven't told uh, Raji this yet, so I'm telling him now, but we're going to make a flyer for the Christmas service. We're going to call it international because that's who we are. And we're going to call it Christmas service because we want people to come because of Christmas. They're going to hear all the Black Fridays and the Cyber Monday and all but spend money, but we want them to know Jesus, right? Would you pray with me over the next three or four weeks about that? And the people that show up on December 22nd that come out of curiosity, just like we had our international Christmas uh, Thanksgiving dinner, we invite them to hear about Thanksgiving and then why we were thankful, we told them about Jesus. Those same people are going to come, I pray to our Christmas service. And that day, my son Andrew, the evangelist, the missionary at Purdue University, is going to speak about the salvation of God. Amen? About Christmas. Why we celebrate Christmas. It's not just a baby in a manger anymore. It's a Savior that died on the cross, was resurrected, and is sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and me. He's going to share that message on that day. Amen? It's going to be awesome. I'm excited. I can't, I just, what happened? Let me tell you how this happened. Daniel was at my house for Thanksgiving dinner, and he asked me, what's the next event so I can bring my friends to? He had 11 people from India here for the International Thanksgiving dinner. None of them were believers. They had to hear the gospel one time. Maybe on Christmas to hear it again. We'll do another event, probably Easter service. Invite them to that, you know, and build a relationship with them, and hopefully by the time you know, in a short while, anyway, they'll come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? That's what we're here for. Yeah. That's why Capital City is here. You want to know why this church is here? It's to reach the lost for Jesus. Amen? And you're all part of that. Hallelujah. So, God, in this, this sermon, I'm going to close here, I think, a little bit. So, we look at, we look at, um, God, we're, try, we're trying to be in control of our lives. God allows us that, right? I mean, He doesn't control everything about your life. You can make bad, I mean, good decisions, right? <laughs> God helps you with that, but I mean, for the most part, you, you are in control of things. It'd be kind of weird if God was in control of everything of your life. Not that two things, get this two things. I mean, that'd be crazy, right? But He allows you to be in control, right? When you're about to say something to your kid, you're not, you know, you know it's wrong, huh? <laughs> you know? God. Maybe put that back in there, Lord. You know, you're, you're in control of how you love people and, and forgive people. Because he extended that gift forgiveness to you. Think about it. He says, if you don't forgive people, I can't forgive you. That's true. So we're in control of a lot of things. We just don't realize that. God is like, then when all these tragedies, different tragedies happen in our lives, and we seem like God's out of control. Think about Paul now. Paul went through all these amazing things. 
healing people, starting churches, putting people in place, and starting church here and there. And we see him at the end of his life. How about in Acts uh, 27? Let's turn there, Acts 27. If you remember the story, he was in a boat going to Rome before he was in prison. And here he's, he's in his boat, and now a great wind came up. The boat was being tossed to and fro. They started throwing cargo over the side. They tied ropes around the boat to secure it. And then Paul says this to them, right? They're ready. The boat is sink. They actually throw out an anchor, hopefully to slow them down. You know, most if you've ever been on a boat, you know, you go into the wind to go over the waves, but the winds were so big. It's like a hurricane strength wind. It says hurricane in my Bible. So the wind was so strong, they couldn't go into the wind to keep the boat afloat, so they had to let go of that and allow the boat, the boat to drift with the hurricane or with the winds, which is totally out of control. You're at the mercy of the wind. So what they did to try to control the boat, they took an anchor and they threw it out so the anchor would drag, at least it would slow them down a little bit. But the wind was still beating them. Look at verse, look at verse 22. It says, but now I urge, and then of course they were fearful for their lives. And Paul says this, says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because... Not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Verse 23. Last night an angel of God, who I am, whom I am and whom I serve, stood before me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the life of all who sail with you. Hallelujah. So the boat was being beat. These were seasoned, if you will, sailors. And they were scared and feared for their lives. And Paul stands up and says, listen, don't be afraid because an angel came to me last night and told me none of you are going to die. In verse 20, it says, so keep up your courage, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. None, nevertheless, we must run aground in some island. And then he, the rest of the story goes on and tells about what happened there. But think about this. Here Paul, starting churches everywhere, putting people in charge. People were being healed just by his handkerchief. Amazing things. Everywhere he went, they were, they were accepting the gospel. Everywhere he went. And also, now he catches himself in this place where this boat, he's going to die in the middle of the ocean. He's probably chained to other prisoners that were there. Because you'll find out, they were, he said, don't kill the prisoners. That's what they normally do. So they want to escape. So they probably throw them over the side, all chained together. It's kind of a common thing they did back then. But they released all the prisoners. Not one of them uh, died. They even gave instructions. kind of cool. Everybody can swim, go first. And then all those that could swim, just hang on to the boat. When it breaks up, grab a piece of the boat and it'll take you to shore. I mean, he told them what to do. And not one of them died. And the miracle happened after that. He got bit by a snake, a poisonous snake, shook it off into the, into the fire. And that whole village got saved that where they worshipped for God. It's amazing what, how God used Paul. But there he's in the middle of a shipwreck, he's shipwrecked here. His life is out of control. What does he do? He just prays. And something supernatural happens. See, in our circle of influence, I believe there's, a, there's another circle. See, God always uses your humanity, but there's something past that that's greater than that. It's called the supernatural. And that's what we have to live in sometimes. And us as believers need to realize that, that God is bigger than our situation. Things that we deal with. 
It's outside our control. We can handle this right here. But then these things happen. It's just, we just can't deal with it. And I want to encourage you this morning. Those things that you can't deal with, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Know that God is in control of those things also. And maybe the reason you're going through them, and sometimes this doesn't feel very comforting, is God is testing you. And know that He is there with you through the whole process. The, it's the Psalms, the 23rd Psalm says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I love, I heard a sermon on this a while back, a long time ago. I'm not going to camp in that valley. The Bible says, if you read it again, read it this afternoon, it says, I'm walking through. All those words are the word of God. It's kind of interesting. They say, well, this translation says this, and that translation says that, blah, blah, blah. You know, and this was, a man, as I was looking at the History Channel, and it said there's a lot of human fingerprints in the word of God. Well, no kidding. God inspired men to write this. So maybe they're not grammatically correct, or maybe, you know, you got a fisherman. They've never been at school. They, you know, they're writing what they saw. So maybe it doesn't match up correctly. That's fine. You still have to be faith that God inspired men to write this for reproach, for correction, for encouragement, for equipping us to do the ministry. Amen? So when he says that the word says there, I'm walking through the situation, walk through it. You're not alone. God knows that you're there. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. My favorite part of scripture. He says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to teach you and correct you and encourage you and draw you to the very heart of God. The Holy Spirit, for the believer now, I'm talking about the believer, the non-believer, the one that don't believe in God, the Holy Spirit is there to draw them to the cross. Not to you, not to Capital City Church, not to Pastor Bob, but to the cross of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen? Yes. It's not about us. It's about extending the kingdom of God in Madison, Wisconsin, and in your life. The Holy Spirit will be through every situation because what He reveals to you is the sovereignty of God. And in that time of trial and truth, and I've been through some stuff, and you have too, and you know that moment where you say, yes, God, thank you, because you read a preach of scripture, or you reminded you, the Holy Spirit, I preach a whole week on that, on God, on the Holy Spirit reminding us of who God is in our situation. Remember when you read this, remember when you heard this word, and all of a sudden in that situation when you're, you're just crying out to God, he says, I can't do this, all of a sudden he brings to your remembrance a scripture verse or a word of encouragement from a brother or sister, and you got peace comes into your life. God is in control. Fear not, for he is with you. Amen? Amen? Fear not, for he is with you. In 2 Kings 6.15, it talks about Elijah and the, the children of Israel coming under attack. And he said to me, pray, he said, God, open their eyes. And there was a whole army encircled the camp around them. Amen? Lord, I say, I, say, I say today, Lord, open our eyes so we can see the power and the protection and the provision that God has for you and me. Amen? Open our eyes, God. Elijah prayed, then he prayed, God caused blindness to come out of the enemy, and blindness came. And what did God do? I mean, this is God. We would go out there with our swords, and we would wipe out our enemy. And God, what did he do? He said, he said feed them. Read it. Feed them. And let it back. Actually, they were in, uh, Drew, uh, back to Jerusalem. So anyway, he said, feed them. God's sovereignty is way different. God's answer for our situation is, oh, so much better than we can do ourselves. He gives us control of certain things. But oh, he, for his provision and his power is much greater than what we have for ourselves. Amen? Amen. Good. This is where God, this is where, I mean, God talks to us here, right? We pray and we read our Bibles. We try to do good things in our, our daily life. Right? But I tell you what, it's so cool. Can I show you what cool? It's so cool when God meets us here in the supernatural. Amen? 
It's so awesome when God shows up in a situation. We didn't know how to answer it. And all of a sudden, he, he, came, he showed up. Amen? It, it's, it's, to me, it's cool. I don't know if use that word in heaven, but I probably will. God, it's cool. It's awesome. I marvel at that. Today, when he does things, just wow. I was thinking about, I think Andy will come and share this story about um, July and her husband, they got saved at two Chinese professors down in Purdue University. They got saved uh, just this year at a retreat. But God's sovereignty, he knows everything. When July felt impressed to go visit her husband at work last April, when she wasn't, she was going home actually, and then she went, well, I'm going to go see my husband. So she went to go see her husband, is how she says it. When she went to go see her husband, the, her apartment burned down. Everything in the apartment was gone. All her research papers, all her computers, all her uh, backup drives, everything burnt. All her research, their life history, I mean her life research, gone. The only thing that survived in that apartment was two Bibles that were given to him by Kaiapa. No way. Right? The bookshelf was burned all the way up to the Bible, and the Bibles were singed on the outside. That's it. Smoky, you know, smell. Not the, all the pages were perfect. Praise God. So they concluded that God <laughs> loved them from that. So they took those Bibles back to Kyle and asked them for new Bibles. The sovereignty of God. Not only for us, but for those that are not saved yet. Right? They won't understand it until they're saved, but we understand it because we understand God wants to see their heart come to Him. Praise God. Praise God. At the winter retreat, at the fall retreat, they do every you know semester when school starts, they do a fall retreat. They invited, uh, and I don't know her husband's name, but July and her husband, they came, and on the way to taking out the trash, and my son felt impressed by God, by the Holy Spirit, to ask her husband to come help him take the trash out. And on the way to taking the trash out, he, on the way back, led him to Jesus. Come on. There has to be a God. Amen. There has to, he says, there has to be a God, and he loves me and my wife. Because of what happened. Amen. God uses every tragedy, every situation, not only for you, but for the world to come to him. See, I, I was thinking about this. I'm going to close with this last story, because this is probably going to hit home a little more deeper in the city of Madison. So I'm thinking about Christmas. I'm thinking about the bell ringing with Salvation Army. I'm thinking about people giving extra now because it's Christmas season. You know, they're helping the poor. They're having uh, food banks. They have it on the news. They, they show all these different things. And oh, we all feel really good about that. And I do too. I mean, you know, some people have need, a family doesn't have anything, they go to a, a church building or to a business, they get a free turkey, a ham, some fixings for dinner. It's nice. Those are all nice things. we got the Second Harvest Food Bank that's really big here in Dane County helping people. It's awesome. You know, people have help with their cars and clothes for their kids. They do the cold drive. That's a big thing they did this fall. You know, all the cleaners would get, bring your kids coats so we can clean them up and give them to children in need. Oh, that's, I love that. I mean, I love helping people. That's part of who I am. But I thought this. As I was thinking about that, I was driving. I thought about Christopher, my son, who came back from uh, him and, uh, his, his best buddy came back from an event and they stopped at a gas station. There's a lady there. She had to open up her car and she's trying to figure out how to check the oil. And so my son, of course, I caught him that. So he goes, hey, do you need some help? And he goes, dad, he goes, really excited to tell him about dad. I asked her and she said, yes. And I checked the oil. It was low. I put the oil in the car for her, you know, and off she went. And he was all excited about helping her, just like people are in Madison now, helping people. But if we don't share Jesus in that help, then what are we doing? We just feel good. Because we do like, to, people naturally like to help. I mean, that's part of what God put in us. But if we don't close the deal, if you will, if we don't go the next step, if we don't, you know, 
don't fear and have boldness and encourage, I want to encourage you to just go to the next step. Help people. Do that. Go help serve at a food bank. Go help uh, do whatever. Do those things, but don't forget who you are. Because what's going to happen when you go to that event and you just help somebody? You're going to feel really good when you're done. But that's it. That's it. You're just going to feel good. You're doing these things because we want people to come to know Jesus. And in their tragedy, and in their cycle of things that they're going through, we don't take them to this level of supernatural and introduce Jesus to them, that hope and the, and the person that's going to give them peace in their situation, that we just, we just have a good feeling. Amen? Pastor Bob, you're really tough today. Come on. Jesus. God is in control of everything. Amen. Let's do this. What are you dealing with? Let's talk about that first. What are you dealing with? What are your problems? What is your situation right now? Amen. Let's do this. Just close your eyes. And you just think about that for a minute. What is your, what do you do? Maybe some of you have nothing. That's great. Hallelujah. But maybe there's somebody you know that's dealing with stuff. You're dealing with stuff today. Maybe it's financial. Maybe you just don't trust God anymore. It's just been in such a financial situation for so long. You just got to figure it out yourself. Matter of fact, you figure it out yourself, but even you even cross the line in doing things that are unrighteous because you're just trying to figure out, you're trying to handle your own finances. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Maybe it's a relationship that's, that's just terrible. I don't know what you're going through. I'm just saying things I feel the Lord told me to say. But in that relationship, God wants to bring healing, but you're you you're stopping that because you're not allowing the sovereignty of God to move. You have to release that control over to God. Do we want to be in control, let God be in control, or do we want God to take control of our lives? Lord, take control of my situation. Uh, that's different. I acknowledge that God's in control, but God, I want you to take control. That's, that's a different step of faith. I can't handle the situation any longer. I've allowed this sin to be rampant in my life, and now, God, I want you to control it. Some of you here today might have trouble with that, you know, internet stuff. Whatever you have trouble with, whatever you're allowing to come into your mind that's not of God, just release it to Him right now. God, take control of my life. Take control of my problems. We surrender to you right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This, can you, as you feel like, would you stand? And I want you to do this circle thing again. I want you to circle that situation one more time. Say, oh. Matter of fact, if you got a you got a person in your life that you know, you're having trouble with, just go like, when you get home today, just go like this around them. They won't know what you're doing. <laughs> just circle them with prayer. Hallelujah. Just, just go up to that person. Maybe it's your boss. Remember you're, you have a boss that's really grumpy, you know? I, you ever have one of those? I had one once. I would never compromise my belief in Jesus, so I'd just keep telling them, hey, I'm praying for you. Shut up. All right. I love you anyway. Shut up. Tell them you're Jesus is in control. Anyway, just circle them. Just like this, do a physical circle. Now, don't, 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 don't be afraid. Now, you know, they're going. What are you doing? Never mind. Jesus' name. I'll ever sneak up. I'll maybe sneak up behind them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, you're in charge of everything. You are sovereign, Lord. Yes, 
Hallelujah. You love us before the very foundations of the world, God. You knew us when we were in our mother's womb. You knew when the day we, we accepted you as Lord, you knew us, Lord. And you know every situation that we're in. So, Father, we don't want to be in control of them any longer. We want you to be in control, Father, in Jesus' name. I'm going to do this. I'm going to circle this. I'm going to say about this. I'm circling the, the church finances right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I went to the mailbox this morning when I got here because, you know, I did come in this Friday. And so I got another $500 bill in there. So, God, it's yours. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys, you know what's going on. Amen? In the name of Jesus. And I believe in circling prayer because prayer together is powerful. Amen? We pray and we agree together. The power of God is, is evident in our lives as a group. Amen? Hallelujah. Take control, God. You be in control of every situation in Jesus' name. So I want to, I want you to do this practice this week, okay? Can you do that practice this week? I want you to go from controlling things by yourself to living in the supernatural. Can you do that? And believe that God is not, don't make it a question mark, but make it an exclamation point. Boom. Yes, God, you are in control. And not doubt that any longer in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I, if I could play the keyboard, I would, but I can't, so uh, I'll sing for you. Hallelujah. No, I won't. Hallelujah. Well, uh, Angel, come up here, brother. I'm going to have Angel close. And you have music? Put some music on. That's cool.